This is the Latin News Podcast. I am your host, Richard McCall, here in Colombia. This week, we're going to be talking about, well, urban inequalities, transport infrastructure, and, well, topics of this nature with our very special guest, uh, Dr. Daniel Oviedo, who is in London. He's the Associate Professor at UCL's Development Planning Unit, and he's focused on studying the social, economic, and spatial inequalities in the urban environment. So welcome on the Latin News Podcast, Daniel. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you because this is a topic that's very close to my heart, something I studied in ex well quite extensively in downtown Bogota. So maybe, maybe this is something that we could jump off into, thinking about Bogota and the inequalities of a Latin American capital city when it comes to transport, health, work, and, and the likes. Perhaps you could jump in, Daniel. Oh, definitely. And, and I think that one of the things that's uh, worth mentioning about the, the Latin American city, particularly the, the large Latin American city like Bogota, which has uh, over 10 million, if we consider it like in its entirety, is that we are dealing with a long history of self-reinforcing inequalities, right? So, so we have we have a an urban form, like a, the shape of the city that began from that traditional city center. In the case of Bogota, would be the centro historico, and from then on, all the opportunities were there, and everyone who couldn't afford anything nearby started settling in the periphery and of course where you have the more the more opportunities the more jobs the more attraction you get also more infrastructure so that's that's where transport comes in mm -hmm. and the the way that transport sort of starts creating these connections and these connections lead to the poorest people not being able not only to afford anywhere nearby to where they actually need to go to work but actually to have from the public sector much less investment in infrastructure of whatever kind. I mean, you can think about uh, buses or any other systems um, for for high capacity or efficient public transport. That's something that that is probably not going to prioritize those areas in the outskirts. So you have essentially what was one city becomes two, and the city for for the poor is that where you need to travel for an hour or more if you're lucky to get public transport where you need to walk because you don't have other choice. And, and that's something that we've seen repeatedly across the region. And, and that in a way has marked that divide between the, the haves and the have nots in terms of, of mobility. Now that's, that's sort of the, the big vision of it, right? <laughs> but also is, is what recognizing the Latin America is, is been a, an incubator of innovations around mobility, the the bus systems that we have in, in cities like Bogota, the bus rapid transit system, actually has addressed that very unequal urban form by increasing speed and capacity. And now we have governments who, local governments especially, who are purposefully investing in the urban peripheries through transport with systems such as the aerial cable car. So, mm -hmm. so we, we deal with a long history of inequalities, but at the same time, I think that from the transport sector, there are very interesting examples to look at in Latin America about how to precisely start reducing a bit those inequalities. I find this so so very fascinating. Of course, as you said, the sort of the, the, the bus system in Bogota, mm -hmm. it's the Transmilenio, a, a bendy bus system that has was adopted from Curitiba in Brazil. And I would say it would, the investment was good, but it would need further investment and to be applied to other transport systems, such as, as you said, the cable car. I know that it is it in Suacha, in the very, in the, the very far. I want to say east of the city, in a, in a very, let's say working class where people where people have to travel two two and a half hours to their work each day and i know in El, from la paz in bolivia they put the cable car up to el alto and of course medellin is the incubator almost kind of like the original incubator with its well it's got its metro system the cable cars they put in trams and the, of course the 
escalators in Comuna Trece, which saved, mm -hmm. I mean, thousands of people time getting to work. Where else can we point to uh, in Latin America that have been truly, let me say, forward thinking in this respect? Yeah. Well, there, there are many. I mean, of course, you're referring to the most visible ones, which are the mm -hmm. infrastructures. And, and yes, definitely Transmilenio taking on from the experience of Brazil. What, what it did fantastically was to add layers and layers of capacity to a system that nobody thought could compete with uh, metros, right? Mm -hmm. So at, at its peak, Transmilenio were, was able to move over 45,000 people per, per hour in one direction, which mm -hmm. for a tenth of the price of, mm -hmm. of a rail system. And then as, as, you, as you correctly point out, I mean, Medellin uh, started investing in, in not only very poor areas, but actually very violent areas because they first tried cable car as, transport, as public transport in Comuna 13, which was infamous for its, its legacy of drug dealing and so on. And that, of course, has been taken forward. I mean, the, the, the case of La Paz is a full network of cable cars. It's not, so so it's, it's where probably the only place in the world where cable cars have actually become the, the default choice for many people mm -hmm. rather than a way of connecting with a higher capacity metro. But I think that Latin America, the, it, it's, it's an incubator of different, different solutions, which are very interesting, both from the public and the private sector. So, so to, to give an example from the, from the public sector, and, and, and I'm sorry, I'm going to stick a little bit more, <laughs> I'm a little bit longer with Bogota and move to another one. It's fine um, with me. <laughs> uh, is, for example, in terms of policy, which doesn't involve infrastructure, but piggybacks on the fact that there is infrastructure available for designing subsidies that are targeting the poorest of the poor of using mm -hmm. systems for for allocating general subsidies, like not transport related, such as there is a system for classification called CISBEN in Bogota, mm -hmm. which essentially gives you score. And, and the, the lower your score, the more likely you are to be in conditions of poverty. That in particular did something very interesting, which was using that which came from social policy and applied it to transport policy to provide subsidies to enable low-income populations to access public transport cheaper. And that's an innovation that, that is something worthy looking at for replicating elsewhere. Then if we look at, at sort of the, the popular transport side, you see, for example, these collectives of things that you might find elsewhere in the world, like such as in, in, in Asia, like the, the, the tricycles, the rickshaws, the motorized rickshaws, which have become a very interesting solution for different types of mobilities. And in, in our research we did recently in, in Costa Rica, we found that, for example, there was a whole system, a whole economy around the rickshaws su uh, supporting the hotels in, in moving tourists around. In, in an area where you would otherwise don't have much in, in ways of a taxi or any way of, of transport. So, so I think that is, is, is interesting to see how from, the, from different levels there are innovations. Like you, you see now in the States the concept of uh, microtransit, which is essentially Uberizing collectivos, mm -hmm. is, is quite common. But you see, for example, La Wawa is a private company in Caracas which came up with a with an application pretty much like like Uber to start providing services for public transport on demand mm -hmm. in a context where because of the we're not going to touch on the complexities of Venezuela but in, in a context where there was not much in the way of public transport provision that mm -hmm. could respond pretty well to at least to a segment of the demand and that was a digital innovation that was quite interesting and is with with its a couple of grains of salt that we need to talk about these things and technology, it was quite positive. And it, it was an innovation that came from the private sector. So we, you see that there is innovation on policy, there is innovation from the, the sort of informal and grassroots innovations, but there is also this very entrepreneurial private sector, which sees transport in, in the region as, as an area for coming up with new ideas. So it's like you said, though, the urban transport, as you say, innovation, it's a, an incubator. It's not social policy, but it piggybacks on social policy. And I, yeah. I guess all local politicians very much understand that the, the transport is, if not the most key issue for, for their for their neighborhoods. Yeah. And, and I think that 
perhaps perhaps that's that's a transition that we're experiencing at the moment and, and it would be something that would be fantastic to see happening more in the future and is to start seeing transport not not as a sector of policy in itself but as a as a form of social policy and mm -hmm. and and part of the work that we've done here at the at the dpu but also sort of many academics in in latin america has been to point out at that at the, the the social value of transport investments and transport infrastructure so probably different to many other sectors where you have different ways of estimating what's the the value of a public mm -hmm. investment i think in transport you can actually start pulling out all of these different added values and this this different reasons for continuing mm -hmm. investing in closing accessibility gaps and economic growth and the the reproduction of opportunities of reducing the burden for example mm -hmm. of of women who are taking caregiving responsibilities for the most part in the region so so it sort of starts becoming a conversation that transcends this idea of the of the physical is mm -hmm. the, the, the transport is about roads and vehicles which is mm -hmm. definitely not the case and and for many politicians and decision makers that has become more and more apparent over time so it's not it's not just about building your way out though i guess we could say presumably uh, what we're getting at here better transport connections in, entirely tethered into a more socially aware, I would say, transport, a, a policy, well, that will enable better opportunities for, for people and presumably as well, this lack, a lack of these trans, this transportation, it, it, it continues this cycle of poorer uh, opportunities, yeah. poorer health uh, and social exclusion. Definitely. And, and in a way, and you frame it, you frame it perfectly when you say it's about access to opportunity. So mm -hmm. it's seeing it's seeing that transport is not in itself about mobility because unless we are embarking on a journey across the Andes where the point is actually to look at the at the landscape, we don't travel for the sake of travel. We travel because mm -hmm. we need to go to from work to the hospital and so on. And is that and, and that means that if we change the policy from a policy for mobility to a policy for access your choices for what to do goes much farther than infrastructure because you can start okay well maybe it's easier to take a plot and put there a hospital or put there a a building that sort of brings together different opportunities such as what's happening with with the care blocks or with this idea of the of the planning for proximity the the, the beautiful thing about latin american cities now sort of stepping away from the, the big Bogotas, Mexico's and Buenos mm -hmm. Aires, is that those are very much still compact cities where people walk, cycle, and or have at least the conditions to do so. Mm -hmm. And we could invest much more in sort of seizing those opportunities and making it easier for people to access stuff, walking and cycling. This, this, this would point towards, I guess it's what is, it was obviously widely praised in, in Paris when they were talking about the 15 minute city. But as you say, a, a city like Bogota or Lima, Buenos Aires, it's going to be very difficult. So we're looking at intermediary cities. I would sort of think, again, smaller ones with less, I mean, the, the imagination of, of a chaotic Latin American city, but the smaller ones tend to be, as you say, more compact, more accessible. Perhaps you could give us a, a few uh, examples. Yeah, definitely. I mean, no, not to discard the large cities, though, <laughs> and mm -hmm. partly it's because it, it might be that our current mega cities are a collection of 15-minute cities. And, mm -hmm. and actually, with, with the research that we did, in, in various cities in, in Latin America, what we found was that because during during the pandemic, everyone had to access locally. Mm -hmm. And you could actually measure that within 15 minutes, let's say, not always walking, but at least cycling, there were quite a few things in terms of the numbers. Now, yeah. the, the question there is, what is the quality of that? So there are opportunities to seize in terms of that. But if we look at cities like, like Montevideo, mm -hmm. which is another capital, or, or Asuncion in Paraguay, where the, not only the population is relatively 
small still by comparison, but actually the territory hasn't really gone through that explosion of both high income and low income development. There are opportunities there to sort of use the transport infrastructure as a way of sort of stitching together that territory and that boundary. And you know that that's, that's where you need to start growing, not so much in distance, but in height. Mm. Right. So you use the, the public transport as an anchor for that development and, and see it as more than infrastructure, but actually as an engine for getting the city to have more mixed land use since around of the stations and so on. So so I think that that's probably one of the of the powerful ways in which you can leverage that kind of infrastructure to make that vision of, of what we call an X minute city. Let's not stay, let's not be uh, <laughs> obsessive with the 15 number. Um, yeah. Well, I think, you know, 15 is the is the utopia, isn't it? But 30 minutes, you'd still be happy with. And Montevideo obviously lends itself wonderfully to cycling and to walking. I mean, the design of that city. I, I think when, when you talk about, so let's say, building up, uh building up and mixed use obviously there's been there was a huge move towards this in in bogota but it it would be about renovating a lot of the downtown sectors as well there's a lot of empty buildings and how do you get people back into them how do you get people back into the places which they've seen as uh, i would say historically contemporary history as insecure obviously Mm, poor transport mm. links no education or education that they don't want? How do you get a a middle class into these areas? I think you start by convincing the developers. And Mm -hmm. and, I mean, in a a market economy, one of the instruments that as as the state we have available Mm -hmm. is incentives. I mean, it can be that I, I give you some specific incentives or I increase your capacity to, to, to build your, your floor or your ratio for how high you can go, or I can give you like very specific conditions for having more premium developments alongside sort of more affordable ones. So you don't lose that social mix. So there are different ways in which from infrastructure, from the development of infrastructure, you can actually provide developers with the incentives. At the end, if, if what I as the government I'm committing to is I'm going to build you a shiny new metro, let's say, which is what is happening with the first line of Bogota, then you are going to benefit from that, right? Because that's that's not something that you're okay. I'm 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 going to charge the same next to the metro that I do in an area that has no bus lines or or I mean. It, it's something that people are willing to pay. So what I'm asking you as a developer is, okay, how, how do we play on that gain that you're going to have and you're going to transfer to whoever is buying it? Or how are you contributing so that public space around that same infrastructure near to which you want to build has what you just described? So good public space that we can invest more into, for example, the more presence of, of social infrastructure or that we can have a park. So, so those are the things that I, I think is, is convincing the developers that is in their best interest, not only to invest nearby that area where we're opening the accessibility, mm-hmm. but also that renovation is going to come alongside that investment. And, mm-hmm. and in many cases, this could be something as simple as let's renovate the, the, and do a whole transformation of the downtown mm-hmm. as a conversation that many people tend to find radioactive, which is less pedestrianized certain streets, mm. right? Because you then you do tend to find lots of pushback, especially from, from those who own the commerces nearby. It's like, no, I'm going to lose everyone. I'm going to mm. lose all my, my, my demand. And what has happened 90% of the times is you get many more people because it's, it's nice. It's nice to have an area you can just walk and and it looks nice and it has trees and so on. So I think it's, it's, you need to get the developers on your side and then mm-hmm. the market might respond positively, mm-hmm. but the conditions need to be provided from the, the building the city side rather than saying people, let's move to the center as it is now because everyone mm-hmm. is going to say with reason, like, hell no. <laughs> 
Yeah, I can understand. I because as I say, I've spent a lot of time in the areas of Los Martires, Santa Fe, and downtown Bogota. Uh, and these, for those who don't know, these are the real inner city parts of downtown Bogota. But it's that it's that division. There's a socio-economic division, largely created by the construction of of two, I would say, north to south highways within mm. the city, the Carrera Decima and the, and the Caracas. Uh, I know that in the US, it's, it's in St. Louis, it's, I think it's called the Del Mar Line. And I think in the Bronx and the New York, there's the highway that goes through this part that's being dismantled now. And obviously there's a move internationally to take these major roads out of cities, but they are also a cause for this the, the, again, this socio-economic divide between one side and another within, I mean, within meters. And you look at downtown Bogota and it's less than, I think, less than a, a kilometer from the presidential palace it used to be the Bronx, known as the Bronx in Bogota, which was a nefarious blocks where everything goes, the most horrendous uh, situation for, for people, for individuals and groups, drug trafficking, drug consumption, and, and everything else. Now, it was demolished, but nothing was done for this, let's say, transient community. And so they've just gone elsewhere, and, and they gather in the same area. And I would say a lot of this has to do because of these divides. What, what can be done? Because in the 70s, in a lot of these cities, uh, Latin American ones in particular, the whole idea was an automobilization. The cities are created. We need roads. We need six lanes. We need this. What more can be done to, 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 to improve accessibility and, and I would say a flow between socioeconomic divisions? But I think that on, on the one hand, we have come to the realization that it's, it's not possible to depend on automobility as the way of, of building cities for the future. Yeah, it's it's an unfortunate legacy of the way that and and here I'm speaking as a as a transport engineer and a planner that was trained in Colombia, right? And and where the the utopia and many of the things, the classes that we actually took were about road capacity and how do you maintain what was called level of service, meaning that you by no means enable the car to lose too much of speed like you don't want to have congestion but then the, the, the response to congestion is never to build more lanes because it's only going to attract more cars so i think we've come to a realization of stop planning for the mobility of vehicles and start planning for the accessibility of people i think that's one of the things that has changed and sort of goes back to one of the points that we were touching earlier and in thinking about that more holistically we think systemically and and see that transport you might have your metro or your transmilenio or your whatever you want as the backbone of your system mm -hmm. to sort of cover those long distances and then use the area and the accessibility that that's providing as a way of connecting it with public space connecting it with sidewalks and sort of more inviting areas for cycling as well to, to cycle lanes and start thinking beyond sort of the sectors and my responsibility or the box stops when I have built the road or I have built the mm -hmm. station and actually say, well, this is part of, of building the territory, right? So mm -hmm. if, if I already provided accessibility, what else do I need? And what else do I need comes from housing, mm -hmm. right? And, and it, it was interesting because when, when I started looking at the history of Transmilenio, actually, I, I didn't know that before, but the, the metro vivienda which was the the, organ, the the part of the government in charge of social housing it was sitting at the board of transmilenio when it was hmm. created same as as the institute of sports and recreation hmm. that's thinking intersectionally because in a way it says well if these are the decisions that we're going to make around where to put a high capacity shiny new bus that is going to move people very fast well who is going to live there so you need housing mm -hmm. and what else can we do around we need parks we need sort of public spaces so it 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 sort of shows that evolution of thinking like there's no way that we're going to solve this by building roads we need to mm -hmm. start thinking across and and see I, I always tell my students that when we need to see transport as a way of literally stitching together the territory like it's that's that's your need and your threat mm -hmm to bring things together and, and i think that's a that's a powerful logic 
to sort of think about how do we transform areas like martyrs and, and some of what you were referring earlier, but that you need a point of entry and the point mm -hmm. of entry will never be a road. It might not be an, an ambitious sort of demolition and the build of a shiny park, which nobody's going to use. It needs to be an integrated thing that provides that accessibility whilst it also creates the incentives for the private sector, which has much more capacity than the public to invest and renew and build new and fun stuff that might be bringing people forward to mm. want to live there. Mm. And, and the word you said there is a fully integrated, it's a fully integrated system where everything is brought in at once. Mm. As I say, you said the transport, the parks, the schools, the housing of all levels, it, it seems like a it, it, it's a beautiful idea, mm. but there's no fast return on that kind of thing, I, I think, economically. No. Or, or would you say that, that's there, therein lays the problem? <laughs> no, no, there isn't. There isn't. And, and I think it's also part of um, it's, it's also part of recognizing that change takes time and that we, we might not be able to see it immediately, but it's worth doing it. And and mm. and that goes back to to the example of, of Medellin and, and many of the other sort of nice things that's happened around transport that we saw in the past. And it requires some courage to some extent, at least to show that it works. Because mm -hmm. once once you had a good BRT, Colombia alone built six more. Yeah. The region has hundreds of kilometers of BRTs post 2000 when Transmilenio started. The same happened with the cable cars. Like today I was speaking with a colleague who was showing me a photo of the meeting for showing the studies for the feasibility of the first cable car in Freetown, Sierra Leone. And they saw it in, in Medellin first. So, so once you've shown that things might work, then they start being replicated because mm -hmm. people say, okay, now I don't have to be the one that burns by trying this new thing, but we do need to have that that kind of a courage and say, well, let's invest in the longer term. And, and actually, the, the, if we speak only financially, the returns of those investment, investments that come alongside big transport infrastructures are for the most part quite quite good as an investment mm -hmm. option. But, but it's being, being willing to let that money like, grow within that time. Uh, and that, of course, is something that not everyone is willing to do. No, um, yeah. yeah. The, the, the continuation of policy that would make it unpopular because of the the lack of immediate return. I think there's also a point here of changing a mentality. Yeah, changing a psychology. I will. I, I I shouldn't go into anecdotes, but I go into an anecdote about this one. As many years ago, I was invited to a press conference with the director of the Transmilenio, who was, at that time it was a. I think it was under the Petro administration mm. in the Alcaldía, so the current president of Colombia. The, the director of the Transmilenio was Fernando San Clemente, who we know yeah. has had issues <laughs> now. He was the former Colombian ambassador to Uruguay. We won't go into that. But I remember we had this press conference and he was talking about the investment. He was talking about the benefits and he was talking about all these things, all correct. But at the end yeah. of it, I said, they said, you know, any questions? And I said, yeah, well, how did you get here this morning? And he just went, well, in my, in my, in my car my with car. My, my, yeah. my driver. And it's like, but it, 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 the responsibility remains also with those people who would usually get into their armored car and, and have a driver to get out of these. And, and this is going to be a psychological change I, I don't know how you do it because it's so embedded in the region i mean colombia obviously yeah. for, for for violence but other cities too i imagine caracas i imagine sao paulo these are big cities with with you know violence crime yeah no it i mean it's is and i i dare say that it's embedded in most parts of the world uh, mm. where the practitioner and the decision maker on transport still gets mm. gets to work by car I had this this experience in in Africa where we were looking at at walking. It, mm. it sort of steps a bit out, but just to illustrate That's a point, fine. where where we were asking people about like why it was about walkability. So do you walk to work or why don't you walk to work? And there was this person in the Ministry of Transport of a country that shall remain unnamed. <laughs> <laughs> 
and, and he was saying like, I once tried to walk to my job from a place that was relatively close, like no more than 15 minute walk. And then my wife started getting calls asking whether we had gone broke or I had gone insane because why was I walking when I could have been going by my car? I think that's the that, that aversion to yeah. anything, but in this case, something as natural as walking is, is something that we need to challenge. Mm-hmm. And, and partly is that it, it's become something of, of a default that we started associating success mm-hmm. with automobility, right? And, and, and sort of, this is sort of a, a symbol of status, a symbol of, mm-hmm. of uh, social mobility, which doesn't necessarily need to be. And, and actually, I think we're, we're experiencing something of a change as well because of the way that cities have started to transform. Mm-hmm. So if you see some of the latest household travel surveys for, for various cities, but let's stick to Bogota, where you see it by, by socioeconomic stratum. So one to six, where one is the poorest, six is the richest. So you see, one and two, the share of walking can be 35, 45%. And then it starts coming down, but then it suddenly gets to six and it jumps up again. Mm-hmm. So the rich are walking more. Mm-hmm. And they're walking more because they're getting better conditions and because you have nice restaurants next to where these very nice buildings of Stratos A's in Rosales or anywhere else. But that that's happening elsewhere. So I think we need to start closing that gap in convincing the elite that is cool to cycle, which some of them are taking a cycle to work, mm-hmm. is cool to, to walk and to do things nearby, it's cool to be clean. And, and that's something mm-hmm. that, that can probably start changing that mentality, but it does come from the training itself and the fact that the way that we were thought to plan was by looking at North America and, and mm-hmm. North America built their countries based on automobility post-World War II. So it's, yes. it's no wonder that that's the same way that those same consultants paid why whatever international development organization were, were teaching us precisely the same thing. Like this is how you reach economic growth. This is how you reach development. I think that's changing, but it's changing slowly partly because there is a more aware, a more exposed middle class, perhaps, mm-hmm. that has traveled more, that has seen other parts in the world that how nice it is to walk in mm-hmm. downtown, I don't know, Venice or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's something that, why cannot we have that? Mm-hmm. No, it's that questioning that needs to come as well from the population itself. It's like, there is no reason why we couldn't have more than the Ciclovia. Why cannot we walk and mm-hmm. play and use our bicycles for more than a few hours on a Sunday. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think underlying this obviously is the, the, the issue of inclusive practices and mm. bringing in vulnerable populations into their work. And I, I wanted to draw on something that you have, you've worked on and it's, 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 it's the children in urban mobility and mm-hmm. equality. And you have a project called on the way to school project Dot org, and it's the comparison, I think, between Bogota and Colombia and Maputo in Mozambique. Yeah. What have you been finding about? Let's let's talk about children. Let's talk about your findings. Great, and it, it connects very well to that point about changing mentalities because what we're looking at there is a policy that well, it's now a policy. That's mm-hmm. the big win, but it started as a program where the the concern was simple: is there are too many children dying on the road who might be walking or cycling on their own to school and they have no way to be safe. So so the government at the time, 10 years ago, came up with what is called Al Colegio en Bici, to to school on on bike. And the idea there was to, with facilitators who are public employees of the Secretary of Education, Secretary of Mobility, to go with a group of children, essentially a school bus without the bus. And then each of the children got for the year a bicycle. That program five years ago was extended to the same notion, the same concept, walking. And and today it has been rolled out in in intense of public schools in, in Bogota. So 
the first evaluation of the program was it, it's very positive in terms of reducing the risk of children and there is quite a lot of other things like pedagogy so they go playing they play games mm -hmm. they interact with the community they feel safe the parents save time because they don't have to walk their children to school so we set out to see something that nobody has evaluated so far and is whether by doing that you also provide better physical health physical mm -hmm. through physical activity and the reduction of obesity and sort of those risks but also well-being mental well-being yeah. mm -hmm. so we're doing the evaluation of the program and and we're finding actually very interesting things in terms of maintaining levels of physical activity creating social capital building social cohesion and the children are genuinely happy i mean you just need to sit down and talk to them they say well i love my route to school i used to I, I remember a conversation that i had with a child who is a beneficiary of the program and he said like look i, I had to wake up like two hours before the start of my class because i was the first that was being picked up by the school van that my parents were paying for them and so I, I was for an hour traveling losing sleep and so on now my i my parents take me to the point of the route and i cycle and i have fun and i compete with my friends so and and that's that's what we want to look at which has been a fantastic opportunity but then because as we started this conversation latin america is an incubator of innovations we thought, well, we need to start learning more from, from our peers, thinking about sort of the broader global south and the so-called developing world. And, and that's where the connection with Mozambique is. So mm. part of our research is not only doing that evaluation, which so far is looking quite promising, although we're still collecting and analyzing the data, but also learning from the process of what needed to happen in Bogota for that to be able to be successful to test it in, in Maputo. So what we're going to do is we're working with architecture without borders in, in Mozambique and with a university there. We're going to have two pilots in two schools. One is going to take children walking and the other, which is a more peripheral area where the distances are longer, we're going to buy. No, we, we're not going to buy. We got gifted actually from, from a private uh, donor, 25 bikes which we're going to be mm -hmm. using to test that pilot. And that's that's happening in about a year from now. So mm -hmm. it's it's a conversation that started where, where we as the, the university in the north, we're essentially a facilitator between a fantastic team of researchers in Colombia with the Universidad de los Andes and, and, and various faculties as well in the government there with the government in Maputo and our colleagues in Maputo who, who have already started sharing experiences. And we're going to test whether that, that works in that context, which I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. hoping it will. Yeah. It, it sounds like an incredibly interesting uh, project to pursue. As, as we wind this down, aside from Colombia and Bogota and Medellin, are there other cities that, that you would point to as being incredibly forward thinking with regards to, well, of course, the, I would say the social equality that needs to be mm. brought in to, to include more vulnerable po populations? Yeah, well, I would probably think about many efforts that have been made. I mean, efforts need to be recognized, even if they're not always fully successful. I think the case of, of Lima is one mm. where through the BRT, they have tried different things to try and, and, and connect better what is an, in itself a very challenging area because the territory in Lima is, is huge. So mm. they have started to make connections between different modes of transport. I think Quito as well, the, the recently implemented mm. metro in Quito, and, and the, the sort of the efforts, both from the bottom and the top, to generate connections with the, the so-called informal transport is also a, a very interesting case to look at. And then one particular example, which actually connects with this story that we were having, that we were just, just touching on the way to school, is, is Chile. And they have something mm. that is called the Rutas Bacanas or Bacanes to school where they have engaged with more of an adolescent population to precisely what we were thinking at before, which is making it cool 
to travel mm. to to school by cycle and and that's going to be a generation of people that is not going to be afraid of going and jumping on a bike and going on a bike to work and not feeling any type of of concern or reserves about doing so so that's that's probably another good example to look at but it, I, I mean, I love cycling and cy will cycle wherever I possibly can and will walk wherever I possibly can. I am very aware of the, the, the failures in the infrastructure to protect me and the, the lack of the awareness by buses, trucks, drivers uh, towards cyclists and pedestrians as well. So th these things need to change at the very, the, the very root of the cause. It's like we are vehicles as well. Yeah. You need to give us equal rights. This needs to change. And it comes back to that psychological transformation and evolution that needs to take place. But as, you, as we've mentioned, is that that, and it's been addressed on a couple of occasions, the access to a private vehicle is seen as you know, an improvement of your social class and economic standing. Mm. And mm. This, as yeah. you said, needs to change. And that's not an easy, that's not an easy thing to combat. <laughs> no no it isn't it isn't but i think as as i mentioned earlier like that that change of mentality in the middle class which are the ones mm -hmm. who are getting the newer cars and so on of seeing cycling as something else is, is very important mm -hmm. and here i want to make reference to the to the research of one of my phd students orlando Sabogal. he he started from a completely different point of view because he wanted to see if leisure cycling so going out on the weekends in the beautiful coffee producing son of bogota of, of colombia like zona cafetera that was creating social capital but along mm -hmm. the way what he's been discovering is that those cyclists who tend to be of a higher income who have a car because most of them commute by car they start becoming more aware of what it's like to be a cyclist so either mm -hmm. they start adopting the bicycle also as the way of commuting or at least when they're driving they try to protect the cyclists mm -hmm. that are going in front of them so mm -hmm. i think is there are different this is just an example of, of the different mechanisms that we have to challenge that pro car mentality sometimes by literally getting into each other's shoes and in this case into each other's mm. wheels of of seeing what it's like to be <laughs> a cyclist and i mean you can you can have your fancy lycras and the titanium or carbon or whatever frame for your bicycle for the weekends but at least that experience is going to give you the consciousness of when i'm driving whatever car i'm driving because i refuse to do more change i'm going to do my best to protect who is literally a fellow cyclist of mine so i think mm. is is that is is finding those opportunities for empathy and and for sort of reducing the gap of recognition i think recognition is mm. the is the key word there and that comes both from teaching the children how to go to school by bike and walking as well as a sort of leveraging these hobbies which people sometimes see mm. the bicycle as nothing more than than a hobby to to create that awareness and to sort of transfer that that connection with the bike in a better way plus everything else that is very structural as you said of having good quality mm. infrastructure to protect the cyclists in the first place yeah definitely and, and no i know that you have a a podcast in spanish called immobiles uh, this is to discuss pretty much everything that we're discussing now just in case everybody is interested yeah pretty much and and yeah thank you for the for the space to to mention that is is an invitation as well as if you're interested in transport in latin america we speak in spanish with practitioners from all over so we have mm -hmm. from the mexico's and costa rica's all the way down to argentina and chile touching up in de more detail about many of these things about cycling walking gender and transport and, and so on yeah gender and transport well fascinating fascinating so i will tune into in Morales, and you can find that on apple podcast and on spotify let me take this moment to say thank you so much to dr daniel oviedo hernandez who is an associate professor at ucl's development planning unit as you can tell his research and academia has focused on studying the social economic and spatial inequalities in the urban environment. This has been a fascinating conversation, Daniel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. 
So I've been Richard McCall, your host here in Colombia. That's right. This has been the Latin News Podcast this week. We'll be back in a fortnight discussing further topics from the region of interest to all of you. Thank you for listening and goodbye.